But in fact, user interface design is this, um, b because it is a, a design and something that fits, it's really hundreds of experiments. And almost every experiment uh, fails in one way or another. And so the people who do this successfully are have tools that allow them to, to try 10 different kinds of things a day. And of course, because users learn, you have to uh, get a new batch of users rather often to, in order to see how users react to something like this the first time out. What truly defines an interface? Is it just a bridge between a user and a machine, or is it a complex system embedded in every aspect of our interaction with technology? Matthew Fuller, Professor of Cultural Studies at Goldsmiths University, offers an interesting perspective on interfaces. In The Impossibility of Interface, from his 2003 book of essays Behind the Blip, he writes about the concept of an interface in our digital world, its meaning and implications. Fuller starts by categorizing interfaces based on an existing definition by pioneer designer Brenda Laurel, who defines an interface as An interface is a contact surface. It reflects the physical properties of the interactors, the functions to be performed, and the balance of power and control. His proposed categorization goes as follows. Interface as distributed throughout and indivisible from the system it is part of. Interface as monitoring and control of a reductive indexical map of separate elements that can be changed from state to state, but not altered. Interface as an associational structure that allows a user to manipulate, alter, destroy and multiply processes and objects from which it is independent. What does that mean? Let's talk about software first. Fuller's view is that software is a blend of information and material reality or physical components. He says that instead of just thinking about software as a series of steps, we should see it as a process that happens within the computer itself. This perspective encourages us to see software not just as abstract code, but as something deeply intertwined with the physical components it runs on, highlighting the fact that we cannot separate information and matter in the digital age. He draws on Catherine Hale's idea that virtuality is the cultural perception that material objects are intertwined with information patterns. If we are to understand informational patterns as always having a materiality, then the interpenetration of informational patterns by other informational patterns is what is discussed here as software. Such informational patterns are always understood to be embedded and manifested in materiality. The architecture of a computer, for instance. Think of a computer's operating system, like Windows or Mac OS. The operating system is a set of instructions, or code, that tells the computer how to work. However, this code relies on the computer's physical parts, like the CPU, the memory, to function. Software, or information, and hardware, the physical components, are always connected and cannot be separated. This takes us to talk a little bit about metaphors in software design. Throughout the development of graphical user interface concepts, metaphors became essential in making interfaces more intuitive. But it starts with a discussion of metaphors because they serve as a foundational element in understanding how users interact with and comprehend digital environments. But metaphors always come with challenges or limitations. Fuller argues that as technology evolves, these metaphors can become less useful or even misleading. Keeping in mind that this essay is from 2003, he illustrates this with an example of macOS's Sherlock search tool, and he compares it with Photoshop's zoom function. Both use a magnifying glass icon, but their functions are entirely different. 
What this suggests is that it is those elements within the wider field of software that are working to the strictures of the version economy, in which a release is demanded every 6 to 12 months, that are going to maintain metaphor or have any need to do so. Such a repetition is necessary in order to keep the mass scale of users, by means of an apparent familiarity, on the upgrade path to perfection. At the same time, such programs develop interfaces and functionality that increasingly replicate those they supposedly compete against in order to make it easier for users to transfer their loyalty from one to the other. Some metaphors are more challenging than others, like the ones that resist change. Windows. Desktops. In a previous lengthy video, I explored the complex history of graphical user interfaces and highlighted how some computing pioneers like Ted Nelson share the same perspective on relying on metaphors in software design and how limiting it is. Let's go through Fuller's categorization now. Fuller uses Harun Farooqi's documentary I thought I was seeing convicts to illustrate complex interfaces in action. The film shows how prison guards use video surveillance to control prisoners, staging fights for entertainment and further punishment. The events were in a prison in Corcoran, California. We cannot here consider the interface between guards and prisoners to be solely representational in the way that a standard computer desktop is sometimes understood to be. The interfaces here operate in many ways, through multiple procedures. Fuller examines the exercise yards in prisons, particularly focusing on the architecture, cameras, and procedures used to control the inmates. The guards watch over the yard from a camera placed at the apex of a slice-like segment of the yard. And using Laurel's definition, Fuller raises a crucial question. Where exactly is the interface in this scenario? If we are to take Laurel's definition of an interface as a contact surface that reflects the physical properties of the interactors, the functions to be performed, and the balance of power and control, we are in a quandary. Where is the interface? In the architecture, the shape of the yard that perfectly matches the area viewed by the camera, in the shape of the lens, its refractive capacity, the circuits that turn the light from the lens into a series of pixels, the slow scan of the stored video images, the height and relative scalability of the wall, the color of the walls. The argument here is that the interface in this context is not a single identifiable element like the software the prison guards use, but a complex system of interconnected parts. The architecture, the camera, the guards, the prisoners, and the social and legal structures all of them work together to form this distributed interface. This interface is not just about representation or a simple surface, but involves deep systemic interactions that are technical, social, and political. What the notion of interface allows us to do here is analyze how they link, how one process passes from the domain of one axiom into another, how processes are reconfigured, stripped down, simplified, or made amorphous from their passage from one medial, architectural, racial, juridical regime to another. It is a particular pathway through these that the guards were able to hack in order to realize a level of brutality that could not be officially countenanced or even acknowledged as having happened. And based on that, Fuller discusses how this distributed interface reflects a shift from a disciplinary society, as described by philosopher Gilles Deleuze, to a society of control. The events at Corcoran stage in effect the transition that Gilles Deleuze notes when he talks about a shift from a disciplinary society, which operates by confinement and naming, to a society of control, in which behavior is modulated, as often as not using the even older device of free will, rather than molded. This modulation is ongoing, processual, a process of relational development rather than fixedness. In a sense, what is discussed here in terms of interface is how, even in the archetypal domain of disciplinary power, the prison, these two modes of power combine, how they stack up and combine, and how one mode can assume dominance over the other. 
probably one of the most important points here is that Fuller emphasizes that interfaces are inherently political. They encode power dynamics and influence how different parts of a system interact. The guard's ability to manipulate the prison yard interface demonstrates how interfaces can be hacked to exert control beyond official capacities. To describe a structure such as a prison as a series of interfaces risks flattering the libido of the prison. It becomes something separable, the discharge of a series of preordained functions, a rational managerial process ordained by science. Discipline as a mold allows the interface to remain something discrete, neutral. Control as a process of constant modulation is that neutrality gone mobile that soaks into everything, but that chops and swerves, demanding constant renewal of adherence to codes and processes. This is what the guards were able to manipulate, the interface between discipline in its predictability and the vaporous insinuations of control. This is interesting because we can probably apply this categorization in a purely digital service as well, where we can see the politics of it all. Cloud computing services, such as those provided by Amazon Web Services or Microsoft's or Google's, can be an example of a distributed interface. These platforms combine numerous components, including physical infrastructure, like the servers, virtual environments, like virtual machines and container orchestration systems, user interfaces, like dashboards and APIs, security protocols as well, like encryption and access controls. Each part interacts seamlessly with the other, creating an integrated and indivisible interface. But the way cloud services manage data can affect privacy and surveillance. This concentrates power in the hands of a few corporations. Additionally, the pricing models and service agreements can influence business practices and market competition. Cloud computing interfaces then actively participate in maintaining and sometimes amplifying existing systems of power and control. For the second category, Fuller borrows from Richard Sennett's book, The Corrosion of Character, where he talks about a bakery in Boston. There, a user-friendly interface controls the bread-making process without requiring workers to understand the actual baking process. Workers use on-screen icons to monitor and manage the baking. Workers controlling the process through the interface have no need for an understanding of how to bake bread. The process is eligible to them. Whilst the interface is extremely easy to use, its relation to the procedure it manages is flawed. The monitoring and control of the baking process is not deep or detailed enough to allow this. Additionally, the socio-technical and economic arrangements of the bakery rely on having a workforce with no actual baking skills. This would increase costs. Continuing with our cloud platform example, we can see how they can provide nice dashboards and APIs to manage vast networks of servers and services. Users can deploy applications, manage databases, and scale resources with a few clicks without needing to understand the intricacies of the underlying infrastructure. This separation makes cloud services accessible, but also hides the complexity and potential issues, such as data privacy or vendor lock-in. It may also lead to de-skilling, where expertise, sometimes crucial, become less familiar, even to the professionals who once had it. Whenever an interface promises to make something clear or speaks of allowing something to work in just the simplest way possible, it must first of all be assaulted with questions, yawns, and scripts, rather than rewarded with immediate identification. It is this gap between a model of function and its actuation that in some cases describes a degree of freedom and that in others puts into place a paralyzing incapacity to act. It would not, for instance, be overwelcome in the steering system of a plane. The politics of the indexical map is produced precisely in its power to command an isomorphic relation between itself and what it controls. It must not, it cannot, slip. An interface here is never neutral, regardless of its promises. 
like how easy it is to use. The initial point of Fuller's explanation of this type discusses how interfaces correspond to the logical processes of a computer. The idea here is that these interfaces are not permanently fixed. They can be rewritten or modified given the appropriate access level. This highlights the dynamic nature of interfaces and their potential for customization and evolution. Only at this point does an interface explicitly correspond to the logical processes of a computer to write, store, delete, read, and calculate on the basis of these functions. It must be added, of course, that the interface of the third kind is never, of necessity, permanently independent of those elements that it provides an associational mechanism for. It may, of course, given an appropriate level of access, be rewritten. Fuller relies on Stephen Poole's book trigger happy to help explain the relationship between game interfaces and user interaction. Poole's work emphasizes how the internal data structures and mathematical models governing game mechanics, like the behavior of objects and characters, create a rich, interactive experience. In order to develop a provisional understanding of this type of interface, I want to approach it through video games. Stephen Poole's book, Trigger Happy, provides a good starting point for understanding the dynamics of interface and what might be a kinesthetics of information. One of the key themes in the book is how interaction is enhanced by the internal data structures of the game, the models it has to govern the motion and behavior of objects, vehicles, and bodies within the game, and how they behave on screen in relation to the user inputs. Poole argues that the realism in games come from internal consistency rather than absolute authenticity. This means that even simple, early video games maintain a coherent set of properties that create an immersive experience. The pleasure derived from games often comes from the interplay of these dynamic properties, which are independent of processor power. What Trigger Happy shows here is that the simple application of Newtonian physics, acceleration, gravity, inertia, and so on, rather than a full model of the material world, creates a small set of axioms that combine to give a rich array of play interactions. Indeed, Newton gets dropped swiftly enough when a little mutation makes for more exciting gameplay or opportunity for a cartoon-style plasmatic world. The sweetest pleasure in many games is their coherent range of dynamic properties and the interplay between them. This is something relatively independent of processor power, think of Pong or Tetris, and extends to the ergonomic and audio qualities of a game as well as the visual. What is important for Poole is that they are an always consistent set of properties. Thus, what he calls their realism is not predicated on their being authentic, but on internal consistency. Comparing this to user-centered design, as exemplified by Don Norman, we see a contrast. Such insights into games compare interestingly with one of the classic rubrics of user-centered design found exemplarily in the work of Donald Norman. The focus should be on interacting with the task, not with the computer. In a video game, the task is precisely to perform the interaction with the computer, for as long as it remains pleasurable or compulsive. This blurs the traditional boundaries of subject, or the user, and object or the task, introducing a dynamic that focuses on the interplay of freedoms and constraints rather than fixed outcomes. Potentially, at least, the standard grammatical positions of subject and object, which work-oriented usability theory is predicated upon, become caught up in arrays of dynamics that are processual rather than fixed and concerned with the interplay of freedoms and constraints rather than outcomes. This experience is not about lacking reality, but about the process of becoming an involvement. This is a virtuality as becoming and as involvement, a link between Halas's use of the term and that of Deleuze, who says, what we call virtual is not something that lacks reality, but something that is engaged in a process of actualization following the plane that gives it its particular reality. Returning to Norman's insights, Fuller's view is that designers must rethink their roles. 
recognizing that they are creating interconnected systems, not isolated elements. The task to be operated on is now to be operated in. Patterns of information operating on other patterns of information. The task is to reformulate the task, to be coupled to that process, to be absorbed. At the same time, the position of the interface designer needs to be blown open. Norman is right when he comments that every interface designer is also a system designer, that nothing can be designed in isolation. However, there is within interface design a tendency to close down what counts as an element within a system. It is an insight, but not sufficient, to establish that a designer of a computer system needs to make sure that it is capable of being cabled up to the other electronic media systems the user might have. We need an understanding of systems that never stop in their unraveling and invention of new connections. However, connections and combinations of elements within systems should not be valued merely for what he calls hybridity, the fact that they are mixed or combined. Instead, the importance of these connections should be evaluated based on their functionality, impact, and the nature of their interactions. Well, I relies on an interesting example from the 1991 Gulf War referenced in a paper by Paul N. Edwards. It talks about footage from military operations press conferences that were used to display actions taken during the war. This, back then, was a new development. It was a press conference where General Norman Schwarzkopf presented videotapes of computer-controlled laser-guided bombs in Baghdad. This was not a literal video game, but the presentation had the aesthetic and detached feel of a video game, where the audience experienced a sanitized, technologically-mediated form of warfare. Paul N. Edwards describes a presentation of a computer game with an output beyond peripherals that might intuitively need to be connected. As we rode the eye of the bomb to the white flash of impact, we experienced at once the elation of technological power, the impotence and voyeurism of the passive TV audience, and the blurring of the boundaries between intelligent weapon and political will. According to Fuller, this shows that the interaction of media, computers, emotions, politics, and materials is part of a system that seems purely technical. Understanding how these elements combine, operate, and their underlying rules is essential when considering interfaces. Back to video games now. We established that the best of video games simulate reality in their own way, and it is a new type of simulation. Here, Fuller talks about Microsoft Word as a contrasting example. The massive gallimaufry that is Microsoft Word has been discussed elsewhere, but it is perhaps useful to compare these kinds of programs, the applications that fill the hard drives of most computers, with the kind of cultures of interface that Poole discusses in Trigger Happy. One distinction is between simulations and games devoted to play. Simulation promotes in certain genres, driving, flight, games, the primacy of supposed realism over instant fun. A true video game deliberately simplifies any given situation, imaginary or real, down to its essential kinetic parts. Microsoft Word, with all its features and realistic simulations of writing tasks, exemplifies a writing machine optimized for workplace productivity. This complexity and clutter are similar to simulation games that model real-world processes, making them potentially less intuitive and more cumbersome than the straightforward, kinetic interactions found in video games. Microsoft Word is indeed packed with numerous features designed to cater to a wide range of writing tasks. These include formatting options, templates, styles, macros, mail merge, printing options, collaboration tools, and more. While these features are powerful, they can overwhelm users, especially those who only need basic functionality. Word tries to simulate a comprehensive writing environment, but video games often focus on delivering an immediate, engaging, and movement-based experience, 
They are designed to be intuitive and responsive to user inputs, providing instant feedback and maintaining a seamless flow of interaction. This makes them more accessible and easier to navigate even for complex tasks. Even when games simulate real-world processes, like driving in a racing game, the majority of them simplify these processes to ensure smooth gameplay. The underlying physics and mechanics are designed to be consistent and easily understandable, contributing to a more intuitive user experience. These categories are not isolated. They often function within and overlap each other. This integration can be observed in common applications like word processors, where different interface types interact seamlessly. For example, a word processor displays text, which is a visual representation, tracks user input, which is a form of monitoring, and provides tools for text manipulation, which is the independent operations. The three types of interface suggested here can clearly also be seen to operate one inside the other at different moments. When you use a WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get interface in a desktop publishing program. You operate on an interface of the second kind, using the conventions of the third kind. In workplaces, interfaces can also serve surveillance purposes. Systems like keystroke logging or web monitoring integrate multiple interface types to oversee and control employee performance. This dual function exemplifies the overlap between monitoring and operational interfaces. The process is also reversed in programs such as those which allow the automated monitoring of employees by keystroke surveillance or web logging, an example of the second type, built into word processing or web access software, an example of the third. One must be clear that this is not simply something reserved for work subordinates, although it is more likely to be applied the more mechanical the demands of work are, but something unleashed at the outset by automation. At another location, at another speed, within the layers of capital's transduction of skill, one could imagine a program for building up data for the use of expert trading systems operating by secretly monitoring the buying and selling patterns of stock market traders. One distinction between the first and third mode of interface is that once an interface becomes entirely digital, there is no room for a vague action comparing the use of computers by artists and designers. One research group notes that there is a reluctance to use computers in the initial stages of a work. Computers do not usually provide for good initial sketches. Another interesting point is that digital interfaces enforce precision through Boolean logic requiring clear yes or no decisions. Boolean logic ties any interface action into a yes or no, where any mark into data is as fixed as any other element. Equally, every object or element of data in a file, once it has been saved from the buffer, has the same status. No matter how many layers are assigned to it, the undo function operates in linear time. The hierarchical nature of control in interfaces is another aspect to consider. Systems can have first-order control, which is the automatic processes, and second-order control, the human oversight. This distinction mirrors the layered complexity of interfaces and their control mechanisms. In the theory of information and control systems, primarily using interfaces of the second kind, there is a distinction between first- and second-order control. In the first case, the control of a steady state of a process is given over entirely to a mechanism, a thermostat for instance. Second order control is where the operator provides an overview of these processes, interprets and recognizes patterns, and is able to react rapidly to them. One model of the human data processor echoes this distinction in the way in which it produces a division of labor between mental processes a cooperation between a high-capacity parallel processing system that functions subconsciously and a sequential conscious processor of limited capacity. 
The subconscious processor takes care of routine tasks, and only in unfamiliar environments and tasks is there a need for higher level control of the processing by the versatile, but slow, sequential processor. Thus, the models of discipline and control are recapitulated at the structural level of the interface and of the subject modeled by it. However, as we have seen, once control folds in upon control, messes with its too easy seriality, opens it to inspection, blocks, breaks, scratches, and streams, there is perhaps the opportunity for something else to emerge. User-centered design often involves usability testing where the environment fosters trust between the researcher and the potential user. However, once deployed in the workplace, software performance becomes a metric for employee evaluation, adding pressure to adapt quickly and efficiently. This may be harsh. Whilst the usability researchers depend for the effectiveness of their research on generating an environment of trust between themselves and the test user, once the software is inserted into a work environment, users will specifically be tested against how they match up against the software. The cruelty in this relation is a direct inverse of the institutional niceness of the usability test. The more that is invested in making the software user-friendly, the more employer, co-workers and technical staff are justified in demeaning the worker who has not internalized its regime. Research based on making software achieve fitness to desired task is as much about enhancing productivity and regimes of work as it is about the pleasurability of a tool fitted perfectly to its purpose. It is not, therefore, simply a question of expertly making a tool most fit for its purpose. Rather, we might begin by tracking the various mutations of the series, axioms, drives, enframements, formations, and so on, that a work brings together and finding ways of staging that combination without blocking out the conceptual and material potential for recombination in different forms or any access to them by others. The concept of whole tasks in software design is inherently temporary. As tasks evolve, the software must be adaptable allowing users to modify and repurpose it beyond its original design. This flexibility is crucial for maintaining relevance and usability in changing environments. Following this, whole tasks that can be measured and designed through at every stage to increase or improve their performability, pleasure, coherence, comprehensibility, and function only ever exist temporarily. Even when the apparatus for their execution is designed, manufactured, and distributed in the millions, the task whose execution they embody may change or disappear. The devices will be erased or recombined, part used, bastardized. It is ensuring functional openness to this bastardization which needs to be a primary task of software interface design. Interface design should be seen as an open process, inviting users to become co-creators. This approach is akin to the poetic framework proposed by Jackson Maclow, where the poet sets the stage for others to contribute. The poet is preeminently the maker of the plot, the framework, not necessarily of everything that takes place within that framework creates a situation wherein he invites other persons and the world in general to be co-creators with him. He does not wish to be a dictator, but a loyal co-initiator within the free society of equals, which he hopes his work will bring about. Another interesting point that Fuller relies on is philosopher Franco Berardi's notion of a renaissance that is driven by technological and communicative potential to reflect the dynamic, ever-evolving nature of interface design. Franco Berardi, in an early text on computer-based media, states, Whenever a social universe forms adequate to the technological and communications potential of actual social brain power, we call it Renaissance. We must remember that this essay dates back to 2003, and through examples like prison surveillance, or the contrast between games and productivity software, or the de-skilling and indifference that interfaces sometimes cause, Fuller highlighted challenges in defining these interfaces. 
they aren't just simple touch points between users and devices. They're deeply woven into broader social and technical systems, entangled with power dynamics, control mechanisms, and material realities. Nearly 20 years later, these issues persist, if not amplified. However, the impossibility of interface isn't a verdict of failure, I think, but an invitation to rethink our approach to design. It challenges the idea that design is merely about repeating processes, tools, and tests. Our narrow, cyclical approach into interface design and product development is baked into how we build startups and companies today, and that will only lead to more problems in the future. Our reaction is important, and there is no greater challenge than indifference. In most cases it is, along with the workers in the bakery described by Richard Sennett, entirely sensible to answer interface with utter indifference. There is so much boredom, structural cruelty, and stupidity governing the physical properties of the interactors, the functions to be performed, and the balances of power and control they perform and embody. The slow, deliberate violence of the state burying its hatred for life inside the body of a living prisoner, a relation embodied in the apparatus directly surrounding them, the buildings in which they are fixed, and the society that provides their cloak, is one example of interface, is one which can only be met adequately with its destruction. But in other moments and dynamics of interface, it is this unleashing of patterns of potentiality and innovation that Berardi calls a renaissance, which sometimes comes as revolution, and other times as the simply careful and persistent attention to opening up a particular range of possibilities by virtue of recombinant intelligence, intelligence that realizes its own multiple virtuality, that is at stake in what has momentarily settled up as interface. And it is by what it combines with, where it goes, what it makes happen, that we will know whether it itself is worth anything more than the usual indifference.